Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM 2. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our Legend Iron Man walkthrough of XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. Last time we left off after making some good progress improving our reach around the globe, with the Resistance Radio Research Project unlocked we now know about the continent bonuses, and we have also constructed our first Resistance Comms and Radio Relay, so we can now make contact with one more Resistance region, and thanks to the Relay we can do so for much cheaper than before. Hey Commander. Now, today we'll start things off by launching our next covert operation, but before we do, I think it's time that we upgrade the last few remaining weapons, specifically the Arc Blade and the Magnetic Rifle. These are the upgrades for the Ranger Sword and the regular Assault Rifle, and we have both the supplies and the alloys to afford them, not to mention that these upgrades might also come in handy for what comes next. Because what comes next, that is finding the stronghold of the Chosen Assassin. Thank you all so much for your feedback on the last episode about which covert action to pick next. This one was named a bunch of times and I have to agree. Now that we have a lieutenant rank soldier in Starfall Antec, I think it's a good idea to tackle immediately. Not only will this give us another resistance order slot before the beginning of the next month, but the Assassin's knowledge bar is also progressing rapidly, so she is becoming more and more dangerous, and we simply cannot afford to let that go unchecked for too long. So here's our squad, like I said, with Starfall Antec we had no other choice but to bring him, but we're actually also taking two other fairly high-level soldiers in Schwaminian and Sapphire West. That is done mostly as a precaution should this mission get ambushed, and because we are sending out both a ranger and a specialist here and only have one each of the Hunter's Axe and the Bolt Caster, that is why we bought those weapon upgrades a few moments ago, so that the two of them have something to defend themselves with while we leave those weapons for today's main mission. Is our specialty. Let's just hope your people can keep up. Now, with 14 days on the clock, it's time to start scanning, and we actually still have two days left until the radio relay is completed. So let's continue right where we left off last time and see what comes up. Alright, so the relay construction finishes undisturbed. Our monthly income from Eastern Europe increases by 100 supplies, which at this stage of the game is definitely not nothing, and with the relay in place we have now actually also unlocked the continent bonus for Europe. Let's hope that we don't have to use it too frequently, but then again having things like panic last only for one turn is definitely a nice thing to have. Now at this point we could already make contact with our next region, but let's first grab that scientist over here. Looking at the Avatar Project progress bar, I think we can afford four more days. And with Twitchy also completing her rehab in the infirmary, we can now fill that spot one last time. Squaddy Sophie Blade, nicknamed Vintage, also still has the negative fear of the chosen trait, but ten more days and we should have that fixed as well. Meanwhile, in three more days we have ourselves another scientist, so let's start scanning and hope that we don't get interrupted. Alright, here we are on the very first day of June, the guerrilla operations for this month are in. I am mentioning the month specifically because each new month can potentially bring new enemies with it, so whatever we decide to pick here we might end up meeting something new. Now first up in Western Europe we have an engineer and I'm very very tempted to go after him, especially with a name like that. However, this time around I really think it's the best choice if we go exclusively by the dark event that is countered, because last episode we revealed that signal jamming is on the menu, and having that go live could very well be an absolute catastrophe. So with Eastern Europe only offering supplies, I think West Africa it is. Yes, that would give us another scientist and the mission is also rated as difficult, which means there will be one additional alien part present. Setting course for the West African sector. The mission objective also suggests that we will be dealing with a mission timer. So all in all, I would say we're in for a nice challenge, especially if we do in fact have new enemy types showing up. Let's assemble our squad and find out. Okay, so this is what we're going with. I think there is a chance for the Hunter to show up, which is why we have Mox with us for a bit of extra melee damage. Other than that, a fairly standard roster with all familiar faces. Ranger Warhawk subs in for Starfall with the Hunter's Axe, while our more offensive-minded specialist Van Dyke brings the Boltcaster. Sky 
Sky Ranger deployed. In position to drop. We got a tip that the aliens have been moving remote data collection vaults on Advent transport vehicles through this region. We've got an opportunity here to seize material critical to the alien project we picked up on. And it's the only way we're going to slow them down. Move in and secure the area. Eliminate all hostile contacts and recover the assets. Menace 1-5, we've got a bead on the Advent Data Vault near your position. Be advised, self-detonating charges are in place at the target. Move to disarm and extract the package before its contents are destroyed. Right, here we go then, as expected with a 7 turn timer. We have a good amount of high ground between us and the target, although our container seems to be locked inside of the truck here, which might make it just a little bit more difficult to hack it remotely. I also forgot to mention earlier that because of the mission difficulty I actually brought two pairs of bondmates with us. That should hopefully give us a bit more tactical flexibility should we need it. Meanwhile, Pretel Mox starts off scouting and as you can see we immediately reveal the first alien pod and you can also see that things are indeed getting a little bit more interesting. A Viper and two Sectoids, that is definitely a new combination and with 30 combined hit points a little bit tougher than what we're usually facing. So let's set things up for the ambush here. With the mission timer and the expected number of enemies on this mission, it is actually critical that we take out this first group as quickly as possible, and ideally also without taking any injuries in the process, which might make further engagement a bit more tricky. I will move. And so, with the group moving closer here and our hit chances improving because of it, we are now launching our first Overwatch ambush immediately. Let's hope the grenade does some good damage here, as we do have a couple of people capable of doing at least 6 damage per shot, which would be enough for the kill if the grenade does 4 damage in the first place. Throwing grenade. Alright, a double force, that's great. Now we are revealed though, so let's see how this goes. Okay, that was a beauty of an Overwatch ambush, we absolutely wiped out this first group. And actually, it looks like we're not even done yet. Alright, so talk about a round that couldn't have gone any smoother. The first alien group is completely decimated and the second one ran right into Adolin's overwatch. And in the process we actually also catch a glimpse of three further enemies guarding the truck, although it looks like they have not yet noticed us. And what's even better, the Viper and the Mech here are standing right next to a gas tank, which Mox is now in a perfect position to blow up. That deals some good damage against the mech and also shreds part of its armor. And since Mox can shoot twice per turn if we don't move him, let's do exactly that and now take aim at the Viper. Okay, so the dodge here a bit unfortunate, I had hoped for the kill. However, our turn has just begun and we do have teamwork in case we need it. Maybe Ranger Warhawk can solve things without it though. Unfortunately, his hit chances are not great and he's also not in grenade range of the mech. However, the Hunter's Axe is almost guaranteed to hit, so let's use it early this time. Lovely, that's the mech taken out as well and now we can move up with Tsunami and yes, we keep her out of cover intentionally here. With Shadowfall, the kill is guaranteed and she will enter concealment anyway. Not too shabby. And there we are, not only do we gain concealment but also the promotion to sergeant and with that, the second alien pod is already defeated. At this point, we can now reload Van Dyke and keep him moving on the lower level outside of the alien's line of sight, while Grenadier Nicholas dashes to rejoin the others. Reinforcements. 
Okay, so interesting situation that we're in. We still have enemies at the truck and we also have reinforcements coming in. Not to mention that our mission timer keeps ticking down and we also still have some loot to grab. Also, I believe that reinforcements are not actually used in the mission difficulty calculation, meaning that what was likely one additional enemy group has now turned into two. So yeah, things are definitely about to get interesting. So far though, we are doing quite well for ourselves and can use Ada Lin to scout ahead. We've got an enemy squad here. And what she reveals are three advent troopers, although as you can see they have a bit more health because these are advanced troopers. Compared to their regular counterparts, they have higher stats all across the board, deal more damage and also have access to grenades. Although admittedly, with 9 hit points, no armor and no other special abilities, they are also far from terrifying. Still, I think we should try to take them out before the reinforcements arrive, so let's activate the part with a free grapple action from Mox. Alright, lovely, we actually have two of them moving into cover next to the car here. That should definitely give us some options, while the guy on the left might actually be easily flankable from below. For now though, let's start off the fight with what is already Nicholas's last grenade, although I do believe that this is a suitable situation to use it. Get ready for a surprise! And there we go, only 3 damage per trooper, but blowing up the car should still take them both out, so let's bring Mox down into full cover and take care of that. Alright, and suddenly there's only one left, and like I said, we do in fact have a good flanking opportunity from below with Ranger Warhawk, and with a 50% chance to crit, this might be all that is needed. Okay, things continue to click for us, that is nice to see. You can't handle me. We would have had another flanking shot with Van Dyke if this had not succeeded, but instead our specialist can now move up and go on overwatch as we wait for the enemy reinforcements to arrive. Minus one five, the clock is ticking. That detonator isn't going to wait. Get to the vault and disarm it before we run out of time. And yes indeed, we do in fact only have three turns left to grab the container from the truck. On the bright side though, enemy reinforcements do not actually take actions on their first turn, and we did manage to stun the advent officer thanks to Van Dyke's bolt caster, so I think we have another challenging yet manageable task on our hands. So first things first, let's take care of the mech and its armor, and we can do that with Nicholas. He has the shredder ability, so any hit removes one point of armor. Damage. This now makes the robot a little easier to deal with, perhaps easy enough for Warhawk to land another kill here. Right, so sadly this time he's not quite as lucky, but we are still in a good position regardless. So up next, let us first grab the loot with a Mox here, which turns out to be an Illyrium core, and then, because he is also flanking the Stun Lancer, we can use Justice to deal a guaranteed 6 points of damage. Accept your fate. Now at this point, our three enemies have a combined 4 hit points left, and that is why we are now actually revealing Sharpshooter Ada Lin, so that she gets into a position where she can also target the mech. As you can see, the shot here is more or less guaranteed. Let's hope the 1% chance to miss does not come true. So that's the mech down, but she's actually not done yet, because with the first half of Van Dyke's turn, we can now use teamwork to give her another action, which we then use to kill the stunned officer. I've actually had it happen a few times now that stun wears off right away, so it's best not to rely too much on the enemy being out for several turns. Well, how about that? Speaking of which, for number 3 we then use combat protocol, and that once again clears the map, at least for the moment.
At this point though, the clock is ticking and as you can see in the top left corner we still have enemy targets left, although with them likely hanging out somewhere behind the truck, moving over to the side here to unlock the door could be risky, as we obviously don't want to alert anyone without proper precautions. So here's what we'll do instead. After reloading, Warhawk can actually blow up the truck's side, which gives us access to the container without revealing anything behind the vehicle. Menace 1 5, this is Avenger. We have positive confirmation of the target package. Move to acquire. At this point, we could now move anyone right next to the container to recover its data. But unlike in that very first Gorilla Ops, this time we do in fact have a specialist with us. So let's reload him as well and then hack the container from afar. Okay, and the enemy protocol hacking reward here is actually very, very good. A plus 20 increase to Van Dyke's hacking score is just beautiful. He is arguably the single most suitable person in our entire roster for this reward, so we are absolutely going for it. Es kann losgehen. Haben das Paket bekommen. Menace 1 5. Status confirmed. The charges are inactive and the package is secure. Eliminate any remaining hostiles near the AO. And there we are. The first objective has been completed. Van Dyke's hacking score has just been increased from 60 to 80. And you also saw it on screen. We do, in fact, have some enemies somewhere behind the truck. But now that we no longer have a mission timer, I would say let them come to us. We will just sit tight and go on Overwatch. Come get some. Moving to Overwatch. Alright, nothing yet. The truck is on fire, but so far still holding together. And perhaps you have noticed it already, we also have two advent watchtowers on the map. And with a small break in the action here, let's see what we could get from hacking them. After all, the hacking skill increase for Van Dyke is applied immediately, so his success chances should already be noticeably improved. Alright, on the left here we have the chance to reduce enemy will by 50% or to gain immunity for the next two attacks for Van Dyke. Before we do anything though, let's have him quickly fly his drone over to the other tower. And you can see it here, same rewards, but the success chances are actually much better. And I think we'll play it safe here and go for the will reduction. Damage immunity would of course be great, but honestly I don't think we need it. Especially not at a greater than 50% chance of giving our enemies a defense boost. So enemy will is decreased, the watchtower is disabled and that actually goes for both of them. So at this point I guess it's time to get in a few more reloads and then continue to go on overwatch. Okay, still nothing, but I think with the magic of editing I'll spare you from having to sit through multiple rounds of this. So let's quickly speed things up here and eventually we do in fact have that last group of enemies show up. So let's see if all of that waiting around was worth it. Okay, it looks like after starting this mission with one of the best Overwatch ambushes in this entire series, we are finishing it with one of the worst. Out of five people, only Grenadier Nicholas got his shot to hit. That was admittedly quite valuable, landing it on the Muton. The two advanced troopers, meanwhile, remain standing at full health. Tactical movement. Not for long though, I think, as we move up with Mox here and then grapple him onto the building on the other side, right behind the two troopers. And from up here, he does have a lovely height advantage flanking shot. Alright, that's a crit and an ability point. Let's see what Ranger Warhawk can do against the other trooper. That 
that's another crit. Absolutely lovely. That gets us the kill. I give you strength. And using Nicholas's teamwork, we can now give Mox another action, which he can then use to eliminate the other trooper. And that leaves only the Muton, and Nicholas does still have a shot, so let's take it, even though the chance to hit is pretty bad. Negative damage. And as expected, that misses, but that's okay. And for the same reason, we can now actually also take a 50-50 shot with Sharpshooter Tsunami. But unfortunately, she misses as well. Again though, not a problem, Van Dyke still has the Frost Bomb after all, and that was what I was planning on using anyway, so let's freeze the Muton here to end our turn. And there we go, the vehicle explosion then actually does a bit of extra damage and also removes the Muton's last point of armor, and with that I think it's time to wrap things up, so let's have Mox fire the last shot. Status confirmed. All hostiles are down and the area is secure. Status confirmed. Mission accomplished. And there we go. Against all odds, we somehow pull off yet another flawless mission. I honestly had not expected that, especially not once those reinforcements showed up. But I feel like that first Overwatch ambush set the tone for the rest of the mission. And so our five-person squad can now return home, still in one piece. Pretty sure I saw that on an album cover decades ago. I would like to assure the citizens of Advent that our peacekeepers will stop at nothing to prevent further attacks by criminal elements such as the one that occurred today. The elders have total faith in our ability to overcome any and all threats to our peace. An impressive performance, Commander. Our troop skills are improving with every deployment. And that they are. As you can see, we have two promotions to give out here. Warhawk and Zunami are both ready to become sergeants, while Mox and Mouth are ready to take their bond to the next level, but we'll talk more about that in just a second. For now, let's give Ada Lin her sergeant skill, and once again we are going with lightning hands here. I think I already explained why with our other sharpshooter, Sapphire West, but in my opinion, in the early to mid game, this is just the better skill to have. With Warhawk then, I think we'll build him up very similarly to Starfall Antac, and that means he gets Shadow Strike to go along nicely with Blade Master, just to max out that crit chance. In the mission debrief then, we learn that next to the Illyrium core, we have apparently also recovered an autoloader and a laser sight. I have to admit, I'm not entirely sure from where, but of course we'll gladly take it. As always, we also bring back a couple of corpses, the sectored autopsy should be instant now by the way, but for now we'll keep our researchers focused on Gauss weapons. Excellent work, Commander. Your efforts continue to bolster the resistance movement across the globe. And yes indeed, with the signal jamming dark event countered and another scientist recruited, I would say we are in a good place. And actually, let's quickly meet that scientist, John McDonald, nickname Aaron J. Muffin, submitted by the patron supporter of the same nickname. His bio is short and to the point, for freedom a Scotsman will always fight to the end. John MacDonald will now do so from the relative safety of our science lab, but I can't imagine he will complain about that. Now, before we make the cut for today, there are two more things we quickly need to talk about, starting with that level 2 bond for Mox and Nicholas. The bond between these soldiers continues to grow. They can gain additional tactical strengths if they continue their training together. Commander, many of our soldiers can improve the strength of their bonds if we give them a place to train. As you can see, the game now tells us that in order to improve the bond level here, we need to construct a training center, a facility that up until this point was not really all that important. Now, however, it is starting to slowly become a bit more relevant, maybe not right away as our next facility, but definitely as one of the next few. Until then, Mox and Mouth will have to be content with only teamwork while we quickly head back to the world map, and after taking note of another supply drop, we also learn of another intel drop, and with a scanning time of only 3 days, this one might actually be interesting. Especially since we'll end today's episode by flying over to the black market, Avenger plotting new course. as I'm hoping that perhaps we can grab ourselves an engineer from here. Mark 
market is open. First of all, though, we can see that the market is interested in faceless and stun lancer corpses, as well as in Illyrium cores, so we could potentially make ourselves a bit of money on the side here, although I'm not entirely sure how worthwhile that is. Feel free to let me know in the comments down below if you think we should sell anything, but more importantly, let me also know if you think we should buy anything. Unfortunately, as you can see, there is no engineer available at the moment, but we have a few weapon attachments, a sergeant rank specialist and the option to rush the plated armor research. All things that, again, I'm not entirely convinced we really need at the moment, but interestingly enough, after lacking intel for quite some time, we actually have plenty of it at the moment. So again, let me know if you think we should spend some on what's available here. And with that, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut for today. As always, if you enjoyed the episode, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Petecomplete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.